Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I am Matthew Silverman, the Executive Director of the Haberman Institute for Jewish Studies. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our program titled Hitler's Jewish Refugees, Hope and Anxiety in Portugal with Dr. Marion Kaplan. I am eager to learn with Dr. Kaplan as we delve into the experience of Jewish refugees who fled to Portugal during World War II. Our attention will not only be drawn to the social and physical upheavals of refugee life, but also to their feelings as they fled their homes and histories while begging strangers for kindness. I look forward to learning more about the depth of Jewish experience during this terribly traumatic time. I would also be remiss not to at least mention that aspects of this narrative continue to resonate today as there are, Jew uh, as there are refugees around the world. And with that brief welcome to you all, I would now like to welcome Elaine Amir, the Haberman Institute Board President, to introduce our speaker. Hi, Elaine. Thank you, Matt, and welcome everyone for joining us tonight from our local community in the DC metro area and from communities throughout the US and abroad, thanks to Zoom. I'm Elaine Amir, President of the Haberman Institute's Board of Directors, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's presentation. As Matt said, Hitler's Jewish Refugees, Hope and Anxiety in Portugal. First, I'd like to extend a special thank you to the Wagner Bronsberg Family Foundation for their generosity in supporting this program as part of our ongoing series on German Jewish heritage. Tonight's program certainly supports our Institute's mission to provide high quality in-depth encounters with Jewish thought, history, and culture. If you're new to Haberman, and even if you're a frequent participant, I invite you to visit our website, HabermanInstitute.org, to learn about our upcoming lectures and classes. We have a really full lineup of programs this fall, including a lecture this Sunday with Benjamin Sommer of the Jewish Theological Seminary. He'll address the question, which I know you all wonder, did the Exodus happen? History, memory, and theology. Other speakers coming up include Jonathan Sarna and John Levinson, to mention just a couple. Tonight, we're delighted to present Dr. Marion Kaplan, the Skirball Professor of Modern Jewish History at NYU. She is a three-time National Jewish Book Award winner for her books, The Making of the Jewish Middle Class, Women, Family, and Identity in Imperial Germany, Between Dignity and Despair, Jewish Life in Nazi Germany, and Gender and Jewish History with Deborah Dash Moore in 2011. In 2008, she was also a finalist for Dominican Haven, the Jewish refugee settlement in Sosua. I could spend much more of our time together discussing Dr. Kaplan's credentials, but I suspect that you're here to hear her lecture. After her presentation, we'll open the floor for your questions, which we'll accept via Q&A function on Zoom. And with that, Dr. Kaplan, the Zoom box is yours. Thank you again for sharing your insight, experience, and time with us tonight. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. And thank you all for coming, even if you're only just coming from your living room. But it's very nice to have uh, a chance to talk about the Portuguese experience of, of Jews uh, during the Nazi era. So let me start with how did I come to this topic? Um, I've been writing about the history of German Jews for many years, so that's not new. What is new is the refugee crisis that's already been mentioned, that today has global resonance for all of us in the last several decades. Today, there are 70 million displaced people and 25.9 million refugees, defined as people forced to leave their countries because of persecution, war, or violence. So I first wrote a book, which you just heard about, um, about Jewish refugees in the small settlement of Sosua in the Dominican Republic. And then I started wondering, since so many of those Jews in Sosua had transmigrated from Portugal, when I learned about Jewish refugees in Portugal, I, I was surprised. I didn't know they had 
there were any there. So I started to do research about that. And as I was doing research, I wondered, how did they get there? What did they do there? And most importantly, how did Jews react emotionally to the sights they encountered during these frightening odysseys and their fearful wait in what turned out to be an oddly peaceful purgatory? An emotional history of Jew Jewish refugees um, biding their time in Portugal may offer us a glimpse into their feelings then and also into feelings that many refugees on the streets of Paris, in cafes in Berlin, or under tents in Jordan may share today, no matter how widely divergent the original circumstances. So to begin, if you see the uh, Casablanca, the uh, first slide that I've um, asked to put up, are we putting up slides? Slides. It's coming up right now. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> okay, in the opening scene of Casablanca, released in 1942, and one of the five most popular American films ever, the camera zooms in on a map of Casablanca in relation to Portugal. We learn that the refugees of Casablanca, quote, wait and wait and wait for visas to get to Lisbon. Again, quote, the great embarkation point for the freedom of the Americas. At the end of the film, its heroes fly off to Lisbon. Most Jewish refugees, however, reach Lisbon via far more torturous paths, fleeing through France and Spain and Portugal, arriving destitute and forlorn. Many of them had already suffered social death, violence, and murder in their own homelands. Before World War II, about a third of German Jews fled Germany due to persecution. Many of those seeking asylum from the Nazis went to neighboring countries, especially France and Holland. Even after the brutality of the Austrian annexation in 1938, very few Jewish refugees from Germany or Austria headed toward Portugal. Most didn't even know or consider Portugal a poor agricultural country under another dictatorship. Still, all newcomers, whether Jews or refugees from the Spanish Civil War, alarmed the Portuguese government. After the shocking violence toward Jews during the November pogrom, also known as Kristallnacht or Kristallnacht in 1938, German and Austrian Jews urgently tried to flee. However, immigration restrictions in foreign countries stymied many. One refugee wrote, quote, every door and portal is firmly locked and bolted, and so is every heart. That same fateful year, Portugal began to issue only 30-day tourist visas to persons who could document they already had visas to go elsewhere and to show proof of ship tickets. Many refugees didn't have the papers or the money, and still they came. Mass flight began with the fall of France in spring 1940. Millions, not only Jews, fled south. If we could have the map, that would be good. Most foreigners, especially Jews, had to get out of France, where the police treated them with a combination of muddle and brutality, sometimes resorting to mass roundups that could end in a concentration camp. Yet leaving France proved treacherous since the French now cooperating with the Germans, refused to give exit visas. Spain's stance on refugees crossing borders also grew increasingly unreliable, making it hard to imagine a crueler way of torturing human beings. Um, maybe we could see the next slide of some of the children who made it out of France. So how did refugees get to Portugal? and how did they experience their stay? I examined many locations which refugees confronted in their attempts to flee Europe. Tonight, I focus on three such sites, the borders that refugees nervously crossed, the lines at consulates and aid organizations that they fretfully waited on, and the smoky cafes they uneasily inhabited. These sites triggered emotional reactions sometimes feelings of anguish, 
sometimes relief, often both. Refugees with and without proper papers faced four borders, if we could look at the map. Four of them, getting out of France, getting into Spain, getting out of Spain, getting into Portugal, so four borders. Would guards let them through or turn them back? Were their documents sufficient, whether legitimate or forged? As refugees reached the French-Spanish border, a journalist noted, quote, papers, those scores of papers that refugees must carry are nervously checked for the 100th time. At each crossing, anxiety skyrocketed, quote, borders meant danger, something could go wrong. Perhaps one didn't have all the papers. Or forged papers could be challenged. German Jew Hans Saal fretfully crossed the border with his fake, quote, brand new Danish passport made by one of the best craftsmen in the field. Many refugees faced harsh scrutiny by German patrols. And if you turn to the next PowerPoint, you'll see the German patrols examining refugees who are standing there nervously. That's at the French-Spanish border. Some were forced to strip completely. Some refugees made the desperate decision to flee France without any papers at all. Avoiding all border guards, Lea Lazego, with two children and a three-month-old infant, climbed the Pyrenees on foot in 1943. And even when they passed out of France or later out of Spain, Max Eschelberger remembered, quote, We'd been told that whoever crosses the border initially feels only a sense of unutterable relief. We did not feel that way. We could not sense anything but the certainty of having lost our homes and everything that we had loved, that there were no returns. Portugal demonstrated generosity at first, admitting tens of thousands of trans migrants by July 1940, Lisbon had emerged as the best way station for Jews to escape Europe for North and South America. Between 40 and 100,000 people reached Portugal in the year 1940-41, among whom 90% were Jewish. Most settled in Lisbon, the capital and a lively port city of about 600,000, where the majority of Portugal's about 2,000 Jews lived. The writer, Arthur Kessler, pronounced the city, quote, the last open gate of a concentration camp. Portuguese reluctance and the dizzying visa procedures notwithstanding, Lisbon soon became, quote, the refugee capital of Western Europe. While tens of thousands continued their exit by boat, and some by plane to distant shores, Lisbon still housed about 8,000 refugees in December 1940 and about 14,000 in June 41. At that moment, the Nazis directly or indirectly controlled most of Europe with the exception of Sweden, Switzerland, Spain, and Portugal. A few weeks later, 3.9 million Nazi troops invaded the Soviet Union. And in November 1942, a new influx of Jewish refugees appeared as Germany invaded Vichy, France. So the refugees are coming and going the whole time. Upon successfully passing four borders and arriving in Portugal, refugees had positive experiences with individual Portuguese and remained forever grateful for their kindness. Some arrived with money that would last only a few days, and most arrived flat broke. You can take a look at the next slide. That's refugees at a train station in Lisbon. One woman on a train heading to Lisbon and obviously starving, eyed a young girl eating bread. The conductor observing her glance offered her a whole loaf of bread and gave her a place to lie down in first class. Yvette Davidoff recalled that having fled Vienna, she and her mother had no more money upon boarding the train from Madrid to Lisbon. They asked the Portuguese ticket collector if he would let them pay in Lisbon and offered a ring as collateral. He insisted that he would pay for their fare and their meal 
in the restaurant car and would give them his address in Lisbon so they could repay him later. That was her first contact with a Portuguese person. Others too report receiving fruit from poor peasants and townspeople upon their arrival in border villages. Most refugees saw Portugal as an interlude and simply tried to get along in the new surroundings. And the Portuguese proved hospitable to their new customers, tenants and neighbors. Rare tensions occurred only when refugees tried to peddle or to work illegally competing with Portuguese trying to earn their own living. Unlike the generosity and friendliness of Portuguese individuals, however, the government and its dictator, Antonio de Oliveira Salazar, and that's the next slide, who ruled from 1932 until 1968, welcomed only wealthy refugees, Jews included. Poor refugees had to produce transit visas, as I mentioned a minute ago, and renew them at the police every 30 days to show they plan to move on. Salazar and his minions stressed their neutrality during the war, hoping to balance the allies and the Germans for a variety of economic and political reasons, including how the war seemed to be going. Yet the warring sides both eyed Portuguese tungsten necessary for military production. Furthermore, the Azores provided a source of tension. Both the Allies and the Germans hoped to use those islands located in the North Atlantic for air and naval operations. Ultimately and late, Portugal tipped toward the Allies. Strategic and economic issues certainly influenced Portuguese hesitations regarding refugees, but Portuguese leaders also worried about domestic issues. Some thought the small country could not absorb huge numbers of immigrants, seeing themselves as a land of emigration, not immigration, losing about 50,000 people a year due to the poor economy. Most importantly, Salazar and his cronies feared all aliens, Jewish and non-Jewish, as possible liberals and leftists who might destabilize his regime. Significantly, and I think this is really important, Salazar did not show anti-Semitism. For him, citizenship meant political and legal status. It was not a racial category. Portuguese Jews were simply Portuguese. Although he opposed liberals, Republicans, and communists, which could have been interpreted as code words for Jews, he did not openly discuss Jews nor use terms like Judeo-Bolshevik or world Jewry as other European fascists did. Many police harbored anti-immigrant and anti-Semitic attitudes, but even as they harassed and threatened Jews, we know of only a few incidents where the police delivered them to the Germans. Individual Portuguese consuls also came to the aid of refugees. If you wanna to go to the next slide, Against the desires of his government, Portugal's general consul in Bordeaux, Aristide de Chuja Mench, wrote out at least 10,000, some count more, visas for refugees, both Jewish and non-Jewish from every part of Europe. He issued so many visas that his government sent two officials from Lisbon to bring him home and severely punished him but his very lucky recipients went on to Lisbon. Now, once having arrived, how do they make ends meet and how do they feel about this? The majority of refugees came without money. As it ran out, many needed help for their rent and food. Moreover, those relatives and friends caught in Nazi Europe beseeched these same penniless refugees for support. Some families occupied small apartments or had cooking facilities in their rooms. One interviewer remembered many versions of sardine dinners because that was the main affordable food. Those without any means or who stayed in rooms without hot plates could partake of a free hot lunch. That's the next slide. Kind of a soup kitchen from the Portuguese Jewish community. 
subsidized by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, or some people call it the Joint or the JDC. Many, maybe most Jewish refugees depended on subsidies from local and international aid organizations, especially the Jewish ones. Starting in the summer of 1940, Lisbon ranked second only to Geneva in the amount of Jewish organizational activities. These myriad Jewish organizations, and I'm sure some of you know the names Hayas and Heisem, JDC, as I mentioned, World Jewish Congress, et cetera, supported refugees in a spirit of solidarity with Jews in trouble, but also to prevent them from burdening the state and then getting blowback from the state. The Quakers, the Catholic Relief Services, and the Unitarian Service Committee, among others, helped non-Jewish refugees, but often Jews as well. As people on the ground felt then, and as historians have since verified, the United States State Department created a cumbersome process. In part, its leadership worried about depression-induced fears of job competition, as well as fifth columnists or Trojan horses, supposed Nazi agents who might sneak into the US among the refugees. In addition, attempts to persuade the US administration and elected representatives to welcome more refugees, quote, ran into the stone wall of anti-Semitism. Severe entrance limitations and excruciatingly slow application processing reduced immigration to a crawl. And those of you who read the papers know this is exactly what's happening again today. I feel like it's deja vu. How did refugees react to the situation? The answer, they stood on quote, lines, lines, and more lines. Forced to engage in a paper chase, refugees spent anxious moments on lines at the post office, at aid organizations, and at consulates. A repetitive schedule of errands demanded time and attention. Reporter Eric Severide observed daily the same routine, the general delivery room to ask for a letter, the American consulate. And this led to gloom among the refugees. Quote, they stood in the main square each day watching news bulletins and gathered to console one another. The Pecalis couple, and you could turn to the next um, slide, had fled Italy. They spent long days engaging in the anxious rituals of refugee life, pursuing documents to secure their safety. This meant lining up at police headquarters for permission to remain in Portugal and at consulates for permission to get out of Portugal. In order to acquire proper papers, Carla Pecalis and her husband turned their Lisbon room into an office. While Alex went out to, quote, visit consulates, police commissioners, travel agents in search of a million things, travel permits, proof of citizenship, money exchange, ship passage, and so on, she pounded out letters on the typewriter addressed to friends and relatives, especially in New York, with requests that went from a simple testimonial authenticated by a notary to the all-important affidavit that would place the responsibility for their future on the shoulders of whoever acted as the guarantor. Refugees seeking visitors extensions or visas waited on endless lines. Eric Amann on a short trip to Lisbon from England in the fall of 40 had to appear at the police office for foreigners. She walked eight minutes to the end of the line. She thought that the line at the American embassy had quote, no end at all. Carla Peckley summed up while waiting refugees faced, quote, a jungle of consulates, police stations and government offices, bureaucrats, red tape, loneliness, homesickness, and withering universal indifference. She concluded, again, quote, it would have taken the pen of a Kafka to depict the world of visas in all its surrealistic absurdity, that of a Dostoevsky to render the nightmare of the petitioner's struggle for survival. In the end, the refugees had only one occupation, waiting, waiting, waiting. And even when one finally reached an all-powerful consul in his office, one stood 
as Kurt Israel wrote to his family, with knees, quote, trembling and shaking. Adding that Lisbon was beautiful, Israel also wrote that, quote, uncertainty concerning my future made any real enjoyment impossible. Waiting on consulate lines heightened anxiety and dejection. Many refugees, like Anne Corey's parents, waited on lines for visas to go anywhere. Consulates began to be, countless began to feel that no country wanted them. Black humor made the point. This is a joke that refugees told. A refugee enters a travel agency and says he'd like to go to any country in the world. The agent brings out a globe and a customer studies it carefully, finally asking, is that all you have to offer? Besides lining up for police and consuls, most refugees also waited at aid agencies. Daily interactions with those organizations provided relief and exasperation. The refugees themselves understood that American Jewish organizations offered a lifeline. Hans Saal wrote that they paid their hotel or boarding house, the food they ate, the doctors they needed, and the pills for anxiety and sleeplessness. Gratefulness, however, clashed with frustration, similar to the resentments and mistrust that often complicate relations between social welfare organizations and their recipients. Refugees had suffered drastic economic and social decline. Hannah Arendt saw, quote, parables of increasing self-loss. She observed that many of these refugees had, quote, felt entitled from their earliest childhood to the accoutrements of middle-class status. Quote, they are failures in their own eyes if this standard cannot be kept any longer. They constantly struggle with despair of themselves. She continued, we lost our home, which meant the familiarity of daily life. We lost our occupation, which means the confidence that we are of some use in the world. And then she described a frantic middle-aged man who had appeared before countless aid committees in order to be saved. At one aid organization, his emotions triggered an exasperated exclamation. Nobody here knows who I am. Nobody knew who he had, who he had been or the kind of people he had come from or the heights from which he had dropped. In despair, he realized he could not overcome the gap between how others saw him and how he wished to be seen. When the refugees finished their visits to consulates, aid organizations, and shipping offices, they often headed to the central square, the Rocio, and that's our last slide, to sit in cafes, a kind of diasporic homeland. The new transnational and temporary home offered a site where, quote, one heard more German and French than Portuguese. Some, some cafes seemed, quote, filled with refugees. Central European Jews, the Viennese in particular, had participated in a cafe culture to the point where a joke circulated depicting a well-known stereotype of them. Quote, the Viennese spend most of their time in a coffee house. The Jews spend all of their time there. It follows that Viennese Jews cannot exist without coffee houses. More seriously, Lisbon cafes no longer simple sites of sociability, although that could have been a pleasant byproduct, offered indispensable locations in which to share advice and rumors. The rumors were called the refugee telegraph. Advice and rumors about the war and about possible visas. Jan Lustig described the conversations as, quote, the emigrants sit in cafes with hollow cheeks and rimmed eyes, stick their heads together and talk and talk. Day and night, day and night, one says with a sigh, visa. Another smiles ironically and bitterly, visa. The third gives a long, excited speech, but one understands only visa, visa, visa. Conversations circled around consulates and aid committees to which individuals had appealed. 
This liminal world of cafe identities allowed most Jews a semblance of normalcy, a place to remember who they once were and feel recognized by others from their previous worlds. Stretching their cup of coffee for hours, women and men found solace among people in the same situation. Many faced the same psychic hell, worrying about family and friends left behind, mourning the loss of homes and positions and reputations, and fearing the process of starting all over again. In a new place, with a new language and new rules. Erica Munn described the smoky, densely packed cafe she frequented where patrons, quote, would rather forego a hot meal or a night in a hotel than miss seeing their comrades who share the same fate and whom they would surely encounter in a cafe. By sharing angst and empathy, cafe patrons bonded yet they were also rivals enveloped in their own misery. They depended on each other for friendship and support, but they also competed for scarce visas and insufficient space on ships. Sharing hope, they needed to repress envy when someone else succeeded. Despite their companionship, these cafes also did not provide freedom from danger since refugees suspected that many waiters worked for the police and occasionally the police swooped down on the cafes and arrested individuals with inadequate papers. Moreover, rumors increased nervousness. At one cafe, a family heard, quote, partly in jest, partly in earnest, that Germany would take Spain in a day and capture Portugal by telephone. From Pearl Harbor until war, war's end, refugees remained in limbo, confronting more lines at consulates and police stations. Visas ran out. Many faced quasi-incarceration in small villages, locations that the Portuguese government called fixed residences. One social worker observed that the refugees lived in, quote, a hiatus, rather like a patient with an unknown disease who waits anxiously for an unknowable diagnosis. Arthur Kustler put it more dramatically, quote, they were all escaping from the past and striving for some safe shore of the future. The present in which they lived was a no man's land between the two. In conclusion, those refugees lucky enough to jump the myriad hurdles between their country of origin and the Portuguese coastline had suffered enormous physical and mental anguish. En route to Portugal and penniless, many searched for food for shelter and visas. They crossed terrifying borders, lined up at consulates for increasingly unattainable visas and at aid organizations for support that most of these formerly middle-class people had never required. And they sat in cafes, those quote, meeting places of refugees from all over the world, exchanging rumors, vying for visas and consoling each other. Ambivalently and ambiguously, Portugal, a poor country whose dictatorial government feared foreigners and leftists, afforded a relatively safe haven to refugees. Its rich and poor extended solace and support and left strong positive impressions with the Jewish sojourners. Lisbon emerged as a symbol of temporality and transition. And Portugal ultimately saved the lives of tens of thousands of Jews who managed to get there. Despite vast contrasts in time, place, religion, ethnicity, and regimes, refugee groups share similarities, especially their feelings about being forced to flee homes and loved ones while waiting for the world to react. No one flees home unless they have to. As Warsan Shire, the young poet laureate of England put it, quote, 
No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. No one puts their children on a boat unless the water is safer than land. During World War II, Jews and more recently Middle Easterners and Africans have fled their homes and histories while begging strangers for kindness. Even if each refugee crisis is historically specific, studying refugees' feelings helps transform statistics into people. As the US Supreme Court put it in 1977, quote, individuals who testify about personal experiences brought the cold numbers to life. Paying careful attention to the words of refugees in Portugal may help us to understand Jewish heartbreak and perseverance in the 1940s, and also to listen compassionately to refugee stories in our own time. Do I have time for one more short story or have I run over? You, you have plenty of time, no worries. Okay, Go ahead and tell so I wanna give, I wanna leave you with a story that for me encapsulates so much of the refugee experience um, from the 1940s. Many of the, re since many of the Jewish refugees were children and over half of today's refugees are children, this is the story of Aneta Sher. Without the required papers or money, some refugees walked through Spain. In 1942, it took 11 year old Aneta Sher and her parents three months to walk across Spain. One cold night as they tried to sleep in yet another barn, warmed by the breath of cows, she realized it was December and began to cry. She declared, it must be Hanukkah and we have no menorah. This moment turned into a lasting memory when her father responded, what do you mean we don't have a menorah? We have the most beautiful menorah in the world. Opening the barn door a crack, he said, pick out the shiniest star. That will be the shamas, the candle that lit the others. Now find the other candles. So I found four on each side and we lit a menorah in the sky. This may have been the one bright spot in her wanderings. 50 years after her odyssey, she admitted, quote, I felt I was on borrowed time since I was 10. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions now. Hi, Th thank you, doc Dr. Kaplan, for a very engaging and uh, moving lecture. And a uh, number of questions have started coming in. So anyone out there who has questions, feel free to continue to put them in the question and answer and we'll uh, get to as many as we can. Um, I'll begin with, um, there's, there's a number of questions about the, whether or not refugees stayed in Portugal and, and uh, what did the, did the population grow and is, is, there, is there still a community there today? Well, to start off with, there were about 2000 or a little bit more Jews who were Portuguese Jews who lived in Portugal. And um, some of the refugees did stay, but very few, I would say, maybe 50, maybe 100, they intermarried. And there's a very nice film about refugees in Portugal, it might be on YouTube, Under Blue Skies. And it's, uh, they interview some of the refugees who stayed on and made lives there. Thank, thank you. Um, we're, so I'll go, I'll go back in time now to sort of some of the questions about the experience in, um, in the country. And so were um, there any, was there a sense that maybe the refugees would have been better off living in, in rural areas as opposed to the city or? Well, here's the problem with rural areas. Those, I, I mentioned those fixed residences, those were rural areas, those were fishing villages. And the Portuguese government didn't want tens of thousands of people crowding into Lisbon. Ris Lisbon was sold out, as one of the refugees said. So they put them, especially those who didn't have proper papers. It was rather than putting them in jail, they put them in these fixed residences. The residences were probably prettier 
um, but they weren't allowed to leave. And if you wanted to get papers to get out of Portugal, you needed to be in Lisbon to line up at the consulates. There were no consulates in these small villages. So those who were in the small villages were in a catch-22. They needed to get to Lisbon, but they weren't allowed to get to Lisbon. And if you didn't get to Lisbon, then you weren't going to get out of the country. Then you were stuck in a fixed residence. So it was very frustrating to be in a fixed residence. Were, um, were, were any of the refugees um, in Lisbon sent back to German control? If they... um, very, very, very few. One very famous case of a Jewish, German Jewish journalist who was picked up by the Portuguese police and the German police and sent back and was killed. Bertold Jakob, that's a very famous case. He was picked up on the street on one of the streets in Lisbon. So, but that's the one that everyone knows and there are probably some others that we don't know, but not many. Thank you. Um, did, I guess uh, you mentioned that the, some of the Portuguese consuls um, assisted many Jews and uh, in this question, the person noted that they were recognized as righteous among the nations. Um, yes. Do you have anything more to say about that? Well, Sousa Mendes um, was a father of 13 children. He was badly punished. He could never get another job there. His kids weren't led into universities. Most of them emigrated. Um, I met one of his grandsons in New York. So I would think that, you know, it was very, very hard on his family. There is a Sousa Mendes Foundation out on Long Island and they, um, they, I think, have counted more than 10,000 visas, and they are trying to fundraise to restore the home that he had lived in. So if anybody's interested in more about Susan Mendes, look it up on the um, Susan Mendes Foundation. Thank you. Did, um, what was the, I guess, if you, if you can want to say more about the relationship between the the Jews of Portugal who are, you know, who are Portuguese and, and the immigrants and did they, were, was, were they a community that supported the, the, uh, the refugees? Yeah, well, I mean, that, that photo you saw of the soup kitchen, that's at the Portuguese Jewish, it's a, port, the Portuguese Jews set up the soup kitchen. They helped, they were the ones, they had offices that helped people get rooms and boarding houses. They were very, very active in helping refugees, extremely um, active. Um, and the Joint Distribution Committee subsidized them. But it wasn't just the Jewish community because it was a small community. You also, as I said, you had the Joint there, you had the Quakers there, you had the Unitarians. You had a lot of uh, international humanitarian organizations trying to help the refugees. In, in, the, in the same light, was, like, what, why do you think the, the, the Portuguese, not just the Jewish community, but in general, helped the refugees? Um, like, uh, the question is, what, was there something in it for them, um, such as international aid or something? Is it, do you have more yeah, to say about That's a about? good question. Um, and I struggled with that question because there wasn't anything in it for them. Um, the one thing that the government insisted that was that Jews would not compete with them at work. Jews could not work well. That's another reason they were broke. I mean, even if you came with a little bit of money and then you were stuck there for six months, you, you lost all your money and your money meant nothing anyway, because if you were in France for a while and escaping from France, the French franc had just died. So, um, so people were not allowed to work. If they worked, then there was some hostility, but otherwise the um, generosity that I've read about is phenomenal. Um, story after story, not just the one I told about the conductor. Um, there are stories of woman goes into a hat shop and needs a hat, but the hats are too expensive. So she says, thank you and leaves. And the man runs after her and gives it to her for free. Those, that kind of generosity or a middle-class man who lets a family stay in his home and then they want to pay him. And he says, no, we, you know, we're not taking money for this. You know, he was being generous. And 
this particular middle class Portuguese man suggested to the refugee that the Portuguese are generally poor people and they want to help other poor people because they have experienced poverty themselves. Um, and I, I accept that because there's no explanation for peasants who don't wear shoes to come out and give fresh fruit and soup to people at the border and then not take money. So I just think it was a, a moment um, of incredible generosity. I wish it extended to refugees more today too. Yeah, that's, that's amazing to hear. Uh, great. The, um, there's a number of questions also about how the, uh, the refugees left Portugal. There's a, a, uh, sort of, I'll combine a couple of questions here, but one um, asks, can we assume that there were ships for onward travel for- uh... Okay, so before Pearl Harbor, there were American ships. Um, and after Pearl, American ships and other ships, but after Pearl Harbor, it was only a, Greek, a couple of Greek ships and some Portuguese ships. And it was quite dangerous because Germans actually stopped some of the ships. Um, and um, in one very sad case, they made everybody get off. At the very end of the war, when you think, why bother? Um, made everybody get off into little boats and then let them go back on, but two people drowned. One was a baby. I even mention her name in, the, in my book because I just want to remember her, like an 18 month old. Um, so it was dangerous, but it was possible. And, uh, but there were very few of them. You know, there weren't many ships. So a lot of people had to wait and stand on lines. And then sometimes the ships went off because a person missed it. Then they maybe another person was lucky enough to get into that boat. And the boats were terribly overcrowded, terribly overcrowded, dangerously overcrowded. And yet the refugees would rather be on an overcrowded boat than stay in Europe because they were really afraid uh, that the war, you know, that Hitler might just run into Spain and Portugal. And that joke wasn't so funny if you think about it, right? Because Portugal didn't have much of an army. It couldn't have in any way um, fended off the Nazi Reichswehr. So that was a problem. So uh, boat traffic slows down. Those of you interested in American history, um, the Paper Walls book by David Wyman and, 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 and another, I forgot what the other book is called, but there are two books by David Wyman. And one, one of them, he focuses on boats because boats also took our soldiers to Europe during the war and went back empty. They could have taken refugees, they didn't. So, um, you know, the U.S. plays a very uh, ambig ambiguous role in, in this period, and still. Thank you, yeah, and, and then as a follow-up, there's a question, I, um, are, we to, are we to assume that the, 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 the ships that were, were available at times, did there was, was there a cost to them with given the refugees had so little Oh yeah, the, the joint paid for it, or the joint got relatives in the United States to pay for it, or the refugees would owe the money. I don't know how many ever paid it back, but I assume some did. Um, so that, yeah, the refugees couldn't really pay for it themselves. It really had to be uh, some of the, um, the voluntary agencies, the philanthropies. And then there were American Jewish organizations also, which paid for some of the money, even if though they weren't big ones that were sitting in Lisbon, but there were others that paid some of the costs as well. And, and where, where did the ones who were able to, to leave the country, where did they end up? That's a good question. I don't have an answer for that. Um, yeah, I just really don't have an answer. I, you know, once they get here, they spread out. I know people who were in, um, who went, you know, who were in New York and who were in New Jersey, and I'm sure there were plenty in Baltimore. I mean, I just can't say, you know, where they all wound up, but they wound up often with relatives or friends and then may have spread out from there. 
Thank you. The um, um, another question here is is whether you can let me know if you if you don't know the answer to this one. But do do you know whether uh, Portugal also became a place for Nazi refugees after the war ended? That's a great question. So I don't know the specific answer, but I did read uh, a couple of news articles which claimed that the Portuguese were just as kind to refugees. They, they were just kind to refugees. So what happens is first come the Spanish Civil War refugees. Now, most of them go to France because you don't you know, run away from a fascist into a fascist country, but some did actually come into Portugal because they couldn't get to the other side of Spain. So they, they first were very kind to some of those refugees and then came the Jewish refugees and then some Nazi refugees. So I've heard that that was the case, but it wasn't an influx the way the Jewish refugees were. You know, that was a huge influx and there was no influx like that of Nazi refugees, but I, I'm pretty sure there were some. Yeah, that's. I guess that's not surprising given the, how, the, how welcoming they were to the Jewish refugees. And also, it's not clear that they were that they knew they were Jewish. It's not clear they knew what Jews were. This is a country that was ninety nine point nine percent Catholic and two thousand Jews. I mean, and people living in the villages on the border, they saw them as refugees. And I and they didn't speak Portuguese. The, the refugees, so no one's saying to them, uh, what religion are you? They see that they're in miserable shape, so. Yeah, there's there's also just a, a couple of questions about the, the end of the in Inquisition. So it's, 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 a, it's a, big, a big transition from that, from that time period. I don't know if you have any, anything to say on that, but. Um, well, I mean, it's 400 years later, it's yeah. 500 years later, my math is off. Um, so 1490, Okay, 1990 would be um, 500 years. It's a 450 years later. Um, I don't think there's really any connection there at all, at least not among the villagers. That doesn't mean that there's a, a very beautiful university town, Coimbra, and some of the students there knew when they met these refugees, they knew there had been Jews in that area. So they even said that, but most wouldn't have known. Yeah, but what's really fascinating is it's a Catholic country, a very religious Catholic country. And this is before uh, the uh, before Vatican II. And so this is still an area in which Jews and Jewishness are often criticized by church leaders. But it doesn't change anything. And Salazar, who is a very religious Catholic, is not an anti-Semite in the same way as you would think of, uh, you know, someone holding a prejudice against Jews as a race. But even as a religion, um, Salazar was a pretty, I think, lonely guy. He was never really married. He didn't have a family. He was a, a economic economics PhD. And his best friend from the university was also an economics PhD. And that was a man who ran the Jewish community for 50 years, Moses Amzala. So there's something there about friendship, best friends with a Jew of the 2000 people, you know, Jewish people in this huge country or not huge country, but very big country. Um, that says something also. And he also wrote an essay against Hitler's racism, which he basically called stupid. So to that extent, he was very thoughtful in his um, analysis. I'm not saying he's warm hearted, but I'm saying I don't think he was an anti-Semite. Mm -hmm. And it's, um... As if there's a number of questions about about the Catholic um, supporting refugees, I, I assume he was also he was Catholic. Am I? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, wait, you mean Salazar? Yeah. The, yeah. 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 And so Amzala was, was a fascist. In other words, he's a, a Jewish fascist. He supported the fascist regime, and the fascist regime in Portugal was quite 
good to Jews. I mean, it was, you know, you, they were businessmen. The last thing they wanted was a socialist or communist regime. So um, they worked hand in hand. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, another, another question here, and I'll, I'll go ahead and, and read it. Um, it's uh, the, the joint, this is a, a comment here. The joint had a busy uh, facility in Lisbon during the war. A woman I knew who was German, but who had spent her early years in Spain was hired by the joint as a translator after she escaped from Germany and wound up marrying another joint employee, an American and moving to the US. Was this a unique situation or did the Jewish organizations uh, hire refugees from Germany to help get them uh, into the US after the war? Oh, I don't know if it was to help get them in. Once you're married, you get in. But um, what I've read a good number of these. So Jews, as I said, were not allowed to work. But the joint came over there, as did the Quakers, as do did all these other organizations. You know, there's a joke about, uh, um, about language. Uh, what do you call someone who knows three languages, trilingual? What do you call someone who knows two languages, bilingual? What do you call someone who knows one language, American? And the Americans didn't have languages. And so they were allowed to hire translators. So there were a lot of translators who helped. Um, the Europeans, I mean, some of them, for example, some of the German Jews had also lived in France for a while um, before having to escape further. Others had lived in Holland for a while in order to escape further, so that in the end, there were a lot of translators, uh, originally Central Europeans, who knew many languages. And they were young people also, and they picked up Portuguese pretty quickly. So yes, there were a good number of male and female translators who were hired by the joint and these other places. Thank you. And um, are there are there any communities now um, or, or people who have come together since since the war who, who fled through through Portugal like if, are there like reunions of sorts? Um, I don't think so. I really don't know of any. So I couldn't I couldn't recommend a way of doing that. Yeah, it sounds like there's not a lot of, I mean there's, a, there's no, many people have asked questions about you know the, where people ended up and, and, and that's sort of like after narrative but it sounds like there's not a lot of um, that's known. No, they're, they're, I mean, it's interesting because a friend of mine is on a Facebook with people from Chernowitz, which is now Romania, but, and it's Chernowitzi now. So there are these kind of Lanzmannschaften, like you have them maybe also from Polish areas and Polish uh, cities, but I have never heard of something you know, about people who went through Portugal. And that was also a problem for my research. I should say that because I would read memoirs, I would read diaries, I would read letters. And often it would be every little detail about how I got from Berlin to Lisbon. And then I was in Lisbon for a little bit and then I got to New York and then it was all about New York. So that it was really hard for me to find because it was like, Lisbon was the end point. And unless people stayed, some people were there for 14 years. I mean, some people really got stuck because they didn't have the right visas and their visas ran out, their boat went ahead of them, whatever. But um, most people got out within a year or two. And then the ones I mentioned from the occupation of Southern France, 1942, those people stayed Reg that many of them stayed another two or three years till the war ended. But I don't get the sense that there was like this community, um, except in the cafes. The cafes were a place where people hung out. And um, as, you know, as, as uh, refugees left, was there any preference given to, to families with children or the elderly or any, any um, not that I know of. Um, that's a really interesting question, but I've never come across that. It looked pretty random to me. Also, you stood on line. So whoever got the line first, you know, and husbands and wives stood on different lines. And sometimes they gave their kid extra 
you know, money or something to go stand on the line at six in the morning. So then they would get there at eight when they took the other children, um, you know, out or whatever. So I think that it was pretty random in that way. But the thing that's not random is you had to have an affidavit. So you had to know somebody in the United States who had enough money to provide the promise that they would take care of a refugee. And one of the people I mentioned whose knees were trembling and shaking, his brother said he was gonna give enough money and the American, the State Department said, sorry, you don't earn enough. So even if the person here was willing and happy to take care of somebody, the State Department required that that person had a certain amount of money, which was a lot of money at that time. Thank you. Um, and just as we um, as we con conclude, I was wondering if you wanted to uh, discuss uh, if you any any of your other projects you're working on right now, or um, any any um, books that you you know, or you, or anything about this book project that you just you just completed. Um, I have to say that one of the nicest parts of this was that I was able to find a country that wasn't anti-Semitic. That was like, when you're a Jewish historian, you bump into a lot of anti-Semitism. My previous book on the Dominican Republic is another case in point. So I think I've made the joke that from now on, whenever I write a book, it's gonna be about a country that is not anti-Semitic. And I think there are probably still a few of them around there that I haven't quite explored yet. But um, I found that amazing, you know, that, and I didn't say the whole country because I did say the police were pretty anti-Semitic and the police were split between those who leaned toward the British and those who leaned toward the Nazis. So the ones who leaned toward the Nazis were pretty nasty to the Jewish, to the refugees, you know, but, but they, they couldn't do as much damage as they might have wanted to do because Salazar wasn't going along with that either, so. Um, my next project, I think I'm not doing the Holocaust anymore. I think I'm going to do something completely different so that I'm not sad all the time. That, uh, that sounds nice. I'm sure that's uh, a, a good next step for you. Do you. So as a conclusion, do you have any, any final thoughts? I know you just, you just had a few, but anything else you want to leave us with this evening? Well, I mean, if I were going to leave you with anything, it would be the political, which is that, you know, these, the refugees we see today had a life, they had a home, they had a job. It's all the things Han I quoted from Hannah Arendt, you know, they had, they had a landlord who knew they would pay their rent. And now they're living in a tent or they're sitting on a table in Berlin at a cafe and people think they're lazy and can't work, but in fact, they're not allowed to work. So it's really, we have so little understanding of refugees in our own world today. So maybe my last word would be to just realize that they are, you know, people who, as Warsan Shire said, who didn't want to leave their homes. You know, when home becomes the mouth of a shark, that's when you leave. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, and and uh, thank you again for this thought-provoking and, and moving lecture. Um, really narrating this uh, tra traumatic human experience that maybe we can have uh, more empathy uh, for our, you know and learn about our history and more empathy for people today. So, I thank hope you again. So. Thank you, and thank you for all the good questions that that came my way. I appreciate it. Bye, bye, everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Be well. I think thank you all for joining us this evening. And we, we look forward to seeing you again at an upcoming program. So check out our website, uh, HabermanInstitute.org, uh, for more information.